so when you think of um, uh, like a metadata store uh, for a machine learning, it's basically that means all of the entities, all of the things that you create during your machine learning project. So let's say you are you joined a competition at Zindi and you are building a data set, you are preparing, doing some preprocessing for the data set and then training your machine learning models uh, with some plots or kind of like some metrics to compare your machine learning model and iterations. At that point, you, uh, as you know, you, you will build a, a training data and a machine learning model, maybe a few machine learning model from different frameworks and also some experiment metrics uh, as well. So layer basically helps you uh, build, uh, train and track all of the, all of this metadata uh, just inside layer. So. Uh, you can think of this as kind of a journey uh, for for your kind of like competition, for your kind of like data science uh, journey or kind of like model training journey. But this is a very special uh, journal that really helps you and it, uh, you can integrate layer into your kind of like existing uh, like Python ID or uh, Jupyter Notebook or Colab Notebook easily. So let's see how you can do it. So this is how layer basically like creates value. As you can see, we have a very simple decorator here called model decorator. I'm sure you are familiar uh, with this one because of the uh, testing routines. Uh, maybe you have used some of them in some of the libraries as well, uh, in PyTorch perhaps. Uh, but this is a very special uh, decorator. When you add this decorator to your machine learning model uh, training function and you return the model, layer basically uh, kind of like couples, like pickles the model and put it into a store, put it into a model registry on layer. So as you can see here on the right, this will be the screen that you will get if you just add this line to your model training function. So you will get semantic uh, versions. Uh, so you you can, uh, every time you train your model, layer will be storing uh, the metadata of your model. And also inside that function, as you can see, you can uh, log some plots. So for example, why, why would you do that? Because I know that like uh, being, finding the best model is a big, is a long journey. So as you can see here, uh, my friend, my colleague at layer have trained a very like different models. And now he is comparing his results by just checking this. Uh, and he's uh, kind of like seeing how the predictions of the California housing model uh, compares to the previous version. So here the purple line is, uh, purple line is from 7.1 and he is seeing that 8.2 version is uh, producing uh, not good predictions. So this is on the, you can do this by only doing this. So uh, uh, compared to kind of like uh, local, kind of like locally pickling the model, locally saving those kind of metrics and uh, also your hyperparameters, this is basically a magical way to really boost your and enhance your model training function. So is uh, are the models only the metadata that we kind of like version and track for you? Of course not. We also do the same thing for data set. We will see some examples. Uh, we have a decorator for data set as well. Just put this on top of your kind of like, um, uh, data processing function, uh, just like you see here, and just return a data frame. And then you will be done. You will be able to uh, log some uh, kind of like uh, statistics about your data set. And also next time you will be able to fetch that data set or fetch that model for your kind of like, uh, models. And also, we provide uh, some more uh, kind of like decorators as well, like this one fabric. So if you want to run your function on a GPU cluster, on a on a GPU that layer provides, uh, we provide uh, up to thirty hours uh, weekly uh, GPU uh, to you uh, for free. Uh, and if you want to run your kind of like model training function on a GPU, you can easily add this uh, fabric decorator and. Uh, you can pass your function to layers easily. So at that point, we will be the infrastructure. We will be the GPU. We will instantiate the GPU uh, instance on our infrastructure, and we will train uh, that model, whether it is PyTorch or Torch Vision, uh, like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, we will basically register that model to uh, kind of like model registry. And on top of that, we have an assert uh, decorator as well. 
just like the other decorators, it adds some very easy assertions uh, like uh, data quality checking or model behavior checking. You can find lots of examples on our website. Uh, so uh, as I said, here is a full screen of, a, uh, of an uh, experiment tracking. On the left, you can see all of the versions. On the right, you can see the some of the uh, kind of like hyperparameters, metrics, or kind of like images some, with some masks. And also I have locked the loss function over the uh, over the epochs. And also, as you can see, you can share this model or data set that you have registered to, and they can easily use it by just like importing layer and then doing layer.get model uh, and giving the giving the paths that we give to you. So as you can see, this is layer COVID and mask predictor. So you can right now use this model from layer to detect uh, uh, masks on, on the people. As you can see, uh, you will get a red box uh, for people who are not wearing the mask in the, in the right way. Uh, so you can easily, we have open source this model, you can find it on layer AI uh, and you can use it for free. This is basically a PyTorch uh, model, as you can see here. And also this same for data sets. So for example, if you want to train your own model with a data set, an image data set, you can easily run this code uh, on, on your notebook and you will get access to this data set in a pandas format. So the uh, you will have the images, peeled up images uh, in your notebook environment without doing any downloading and like conversion, base 64 conversion or anything. And also one of the best part of layer is we give you, uh, we enable you to kind of like collect everything under a project. So let's say you did some modeling, as you can see on the left, this is the mask predictor uh, model, and you had uh, kind of like locked your loss function and you had locked uh, some uh, predictions. So what you can do is you can just write a very simple readme.md file uh, in the same uh, path, put a um, uh, readme.md file uh, in the same path of your kind of like notebook. And then you can insert those predictions. You can insert those functions in your uh, kind of like markdown. We have uh, kind of like extensive uh, documentation about this, how to do this. But every time you train your model, this will be changing. So rather than kind of like creating static, uh, static reports, you can easily create some dynamic reports for your projects so that you can share your findings with uh, everyone. And also we, of course, we invite you to take part in our community. So if you go to layer.ai and click the community, uh, you will be able to find lots of machine learning models, lots of open source data sets, uh, like real world use cases and some open source machine learning projects with their source code on layer uh, community. So you can use that. So well, like before ending, this is all for free. We are turning to monetize through enterprises, but for you, it's free. You can use uh, unlimited CPU training time. You can uh, train uh, models, uh, log your models, or kind of like your, log your data sets uh, like, uh, without a limitation. Uh, we provide unlimited projects, uh, models, and data sets uh, registration, uh, by the way. And also, uh, like I said, uh, we have we also offer up to 30 hours of GPU for free. Uh, you don't have to pay anything so that you can take part in, in our community. Uh, yeah, that's it. I guess I hope I'm, I didn't go over time. Uh, but if you have questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Thanks so much, Mehmet. Um, I think that you were exactly on time, so well <laughs> done for that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I think for me, I don't I don't know too much about layer.ai either. So it's been really nice to learn a little bit. I can see some really good potential for future collaborations, and mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing some Dundee data sets and models appearing on layer.ai as well. Um, yep. I do have a question from the community, so I'll pop that here from Yape mm -hmm. Asuke Ronald. Um, and his question is, is the same, is this the same as TensorBoard? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thanks for that. Uh, we basically like provide a, a meta store uh, on the cloud. So if you do this on TensorBoard, TensorBoard, of course you can log some stuff, uh, but it, you will it will be really hard for you to kind of like share that TensorBoard and keep it up to date. And also the uh, other thing is in TensorBoard you basically log 
some stuff during training. But here in layer, as you can see, machine learning models and data sets are first class citizens. So it makes them easy to kind of like uh, use their kind of like on uh, to manage their uh, life cycle. Uh, so uh, like we are much more kind of like opinionated about the machine learning projects rather than whether when while TensorBoard is all about kind of like model training and logging some uh, data during model training. So you can use layer for production. Emma. You are muted, Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much. A follow-up question there is, does it support every machine learning framework? Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you go to our documentation, you can click documentation on layer.ai. You will see that every uh, kind of like framework is supported. TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, uh, like all of the uh, popular machine learning models uh, like frameworks are supported. And then the last question, and this, I, I'm not sure exactly the, the tone of voice to read this in, but the question is, how is this service free? Uh, yeah. Maybe surprised <laughs> or incredulous? <laughs> no, uh, like uh, since we are a startup, uh, like we want to kind of like build a community around the tool. So we believe that we, if we go with a freemium model, we can build a community while generating revenue from the uh, kind of like enterprise uh, customers. So with the support we get from our enterprise customers, we can offer for free. So the main idea here is to offer this tool to students, uh, kind of like machine learning practitioners for free so that they can get used to it. And then when they go to a company, start working at a company, hopefully they will uh, kind of like share uh, their love product layers with their managers and kind of like um, directors. At that point, like we will be monetizing from those enterprise customers. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a great model and, and really nice to have that kind of support offered to our community. I think there a lot of a lot of our users are, are going to be able to put this in. Place. So thank you very much, Mehmet. It was really great to hear from you and um, we'll move on. But I'm sure we'll uh, see and hear for you, from you again before the end of our, um, our series. OK, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity for telling a little you. bit about later. Thank you. Great. Um, right. So uh, that was great to hear from Mehmet. And I hope you guys will go out and test out Layer and maybe even put some of your Zindi models up on Layer so that we can share that with that community as well. Um, and if you do use it, let us know. We'd love to know um, how it works for you, what works, what doesn't, um, if it helped you in your hackathon this weekend. Um, that would be great to hear as well. Right, so uh, now getting into a little bit more of the specifics of this hackathon this weekend. I'm really, really excited. I have to say that we're finally hosting a soccer challenge on Zindi. We have been hoping and planning and scheming a way to, to get some soccer data onto the platform because we know how passionate um, our users are and, and I think soccer runs and football runs in the blood of almost every African. Um, so I'm I'm really really thrilled to um, welcome Lee Moyo to our webinar today. Uh, Lee is from the Duma Analytics. Um, he introduces himself as a data editor with experience working in analysis and visualization. Um, the Duma Analytics is a for-profit organization that aims to provide coverage of football leagues through various data and analytics solution. Um, and this is achieved by introducing and developing statistical evaluation of players and teams within the BSDB Premiership. So um, I'm going to stop there because I'm sure Lee will be able to explain how that all works in much better in uh, much better detail than I could. Um, Lee, uh, hopefully you can tell us a little bit more about the Doom Analytics as well as about the data that everybody's going to be working on um, today and this weekend. Over to you. OK, uh, thank you very much, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, greetings to everyone. Um, we're very excited for this partnership um, and to see how we work together going forward. Um, as the introduction was made, my name is Lee. Full name is Linde Lue. Um, I am here in Cape Town, South Africa and part of a two-man team that works on large analytics. Um, 
as the word says, laduma, a very soccer type word to say goal in local language. And analytics is, um, as everyone here, as you would know, um, just a merge of the local soccer with the new wave of data that's happening nowadays. So I'm just going to share my screen a little bit um, to give a bit more background. Um, and then we'll leave some time as well for questions after that. So starting here with the first slide, basically an introduction um, into who we are. Um, the description that we use when we are presenting is that we want to make soccer data accessible and understandable for the whole of the African continent. So by definition, we are a startup um, and we have been running this for the last two and a half years. Um, we've been involved in soccer data for about five years, but then the actual startup itself, where we came up with the idea to work on a platform or a, an app where fans can be able to access the data which they don't have access to, that's something which we've been working on for the last two and a half years. So the problem is that the most popular sport in the continent, we all know is soccer. And nowadays it generates large volumes of data. Um, there is, depending on the data set, you can get millions of rows in a season for a single league um, or millions of data points rather for a season in a single league. Um, and this data for the ordinary fan, it is still very confusing. So it remains inaccessible um, to fans and the wider football industry, to teams as well. It's inaccessible to betting houses, it's inaccessible. Um, and so powerful insights are unharnessed, um, leaving these participants behind. And if you follow soccer, a lot of people have two teams, right? People have the European team and then they have their local team, whatever country they are in. Um, a European team would be an example, a Liverpool or Real Madrid. And you follow them religiously. Um, and you also follow your local team where you have a strong social tie you also follow religiously. And as we follow our games in Europe and locally, we always see the differences, not just in playing style, but nowadays we see the differences in the use of data in the game, whether it's in recruiting players, whether it's in making decisions or whether it's in betting as well or broadcasting. So that's the market that we were trying to come into to say there's a gap between what's happening in Europe with data and what's happening on our African continent with the same data that's available. So we have created this startup to come and fill in that gap and try and find the right solution for the problem that we have identified. And so we want to provide access, as I said earlier on, to soccer data on digital platforms. And we've been doing that mostly through visualizations. Um, these visualizations are more descriptive. They describe what has happened in the games so fans can know how their teams have performed or how particular players of interest have also performed. Our solution is also usable. We, we, we make, we clean, we spend a lot of time cleaning the data. Um, more than anything else. And then we present that in usable formats for fans to use or for media as well to use when telling their stories. And so we keep on adding different types of visualizations um, over the last two years, providing insights into different aspects of the game because as much as you're trying to catch up with Europe in this, in, in this realm, they are also still moving forward and further. And so it's always hard to catch up. We're always trying to add new visualizations to bring better insights into the game. So we've been trained um, not formally, but informally by some of the biggest companies in sports data from the guys at Opta, you guys may know them as well, or StatsBomb. We've attended some of their courses, some of their um, presentations as well. We've been to some of their forums in person in England to try and understand where the world is going in terms of soccer and sports data. And so who do we focus on? Fans and punters, soccer fans, those who are also making investments in terms of betting into this. You want to show them from the data that this is what is happening and this is what you can expect in the next game that's coming or the next season that's coming. We also focus on sports broadcasters and betting companies. We have a few clients there who we enable to tell powerful stories using data and we enable them as well to ensure brand consistency by being having the ability to design some of these themselves. And also it helps them share compelling narratives inside of studio and unique content that helps them to drive um, their betting activity. Our third set of clients is teams and 
frustrations, usually lower league teams, sometimes scouting teams as well, that are looking for players that are still unfound um, and want to sell them on into bigger um, teams. So we have a few clients in that space as well who are involved in scouting, but they want it to be database. And so we, we are in the center of that, helping fans understand the game, having broadcasters tell better stories and helping teams and federations make better decisions in terms of scouting and also selling on players as well. So that's, that's in a nutshell who Laduma is. A lot of the work we've done all along has been, as I say, descriptive. Um, we've been describing what is happening in the games, but now we always want to look forward as well and try and help people to predict um, what's coming, um, whether it's one game, who will win that game, whether it's a season, who will be the next champion. Um, that's our current interest. And that's where that coincidence of um, interest ended up landing us on Zinta's table. And we came together, had a meeting and said, hey, let's try something and see how that works. So that's who we are, Ladum Analytics. Excited to be here. And I'll open up for any questions that uh, Zindi or anyone else may have. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Lee. And just putting my getting my spotlight right. There we go. Um, thank you so much. Uh, great to get a little bit of insight, and I think it's such a a vast and untapped opportunity here. I'm really excited to see where you guys go because I think it's just as you say, there's just so much data and it's currently completely unharnessed. So um, really, really exciting. Um, I have a question from Pa Osman Sise. Uh, he asks, do you have data for all African countries or just a select few for now? So for now, it's just a select few. We don't have data for all African countries. Um, we get data as well from a service provider who provides the data. We don't mine it ourselves. Um, we buy it in a very raw form from them but then they also have, they don't have access to every league in the country. So it's a select few, your top um, North African leagues, some in Southern Africa and West Africa as well. And when you get that subscription, you get to choose which of the countries you want to work on. Um, and so we work on countries where we have partnerships and where we can sell the media onto so that we don't subscribe for nothing um, with a different country. Great. Um, the next question, and I think you touched on this, can you tell us which leagues you currently have data for? Maybe you don't want to go into specifics, but if, if you can, what, what leagues are you currently working in? So we currently have data for the North African leagues, uh, Morocco, Egypt, um, I think Algeria, because we get a subscription, as I said, for five countries. And then we also have data for South Africa. And I think the fifth one could be Nigeria, I'm not too sure. Um, but then those are the five that we currently focus on. But because we're based in South Africa as well, a lot of our work is more on this local league um, and a bit on the national teams as well. Brilliant. And then a question from Yate Asaka Ronald. Um, what is the period range of your data? You might um, have data from 2000 or is it more recent than that? So it's more recent. Uh, in fact, there's two sets we have. We have a... Mm -hmm. We have match sheet data, um, who played, who won, who scored, what time they scored, the basic yes. stuff that we yes. have from the mid nineties, um, mm -hmm. that's enough. But then when it comes to the details, uh, the passes, the interceptions and all the event data um, mm -hmm. and some tracking data, it's only the last four or five years when this right. has become available as well. So mm -hmm. the reason it's still inaccessible in South Africa is because it's the whole process um, to gather the data. Um, there is a lot of manual work that's taken by these companies to, to code and make sure that the data is usable. Um, yes. the, so it, it takes a lot of work. And once they do that, then the price becomes very high as well. So many yeah. countries, uh, even clubs, national teams, they, they can't even afford the data from the data providers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. ours that we have for the last four or five years, it's more entry level as well. Um, the expected goals models that are used for that are very basic, um, mm -hmm. but then it's what is affordable at the moment that would enable yes. a club yeah, to make a small decision or a startup like us to get into the space. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and I, I guess there's, 
there's so much room for, for machine learning solutions in terms of automation, data cleaning, um, missing data, that sort of thing. So I think this is a, an area ripe for, for innovation. Absolutely. Um, I think we are, we find ourselves in the, in a space where we are more of a, of a retailer, uh, if I may say. Mm. Um, we're, not a, we're not creating the data, we are, we are getting it to wholesale. Um, and then we're retailing it and selling it on to our clients. But the long run or what we see as an opportunity, like any retailer would, is to go a step back into, uh, in, into the production line or the value chain yeah. and yeah, start yeah. creating your own data um, by mining it from the very go. And that way it will cut your, cost, cut your costs in a big way and also help you to customize that type of data. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so the next question is, and I think you've actually answered this, is it only top flight leagues? You, you, it seems as though you focus on national leagues specifically. Yes, just the top flight, yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. And then oh, there's another question whether there's ways to, the, the question is whether there's a way to access this data for free for analysis and machine learning projects. Um, I think that this is as a as a learner or as a student. Do you have any efforts in that regard, or, is, or would they need to join as Indie Challenge in order to get access? To this data? Yeah, I think for now you'd have to join as Indie Challenge. Um, that's where we've made the data accessible in partnership with Cindy. Um, but then outside of this, look, this data is very expensive. Hey, eh? <laughs> um, there are there are companies that would charge up to. 100,000 rand a month for a team wow. to get access for the data itself. For a company like Stats Perform, or previously known as Opta. So to get it for free, that would be very difficult. Um, you may look for a trial at the top three or four data providers, and they may mm. give you a one week trial to play with the data. But if you want to get non African data, Stats Perform has some pretty good free data that's available where they offer that so that people can learn and, and work on um, their own models using their own um, tools as well. So StatsBomb that's definitely has a company Statsbomb. that offers free data, but then it's mostly European, um, not much you find in the African leagues because they are still also, um, they're still young, they still consider themselves a startup as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question, and it, it will be uh, more focused on this challenge that we're running particularly. Can you tell us a little bit about the data that has been provided and what you're hoping to get out of this specific challenge before we hear from Rose on the tutorial? Okay, um, so for this specific challenge, um, we thought we'll keep it simple. Um, the question is, can we predict who's going to win the next game <laughs> based on a number of variables that come into the data set? Um, so we have event data, which is uh, passes, tackles, interceptions based on a number of teams. And those passes also have X, Y coordinates in terms of where do the passes start, where do they stop? So you can maybe see how dangerous a team is. Do they make a lot of inroads going further up the field or do they spend most of their time passing backwards? Um, the, the most common event in a in event data is passes. So there is so many passes that happen in a game. Um, and so in a row, in a match set of 3,000 rows, maybe 2,000 of rows are just passes because teams are passing, passing, passing all the time. So what can those passes tell us about the next game? And then the most valuable action in football is a shot because a shot leads to a goal and goals win games. So there's also a question of how dangerous are these shots? Are they in the right positions? Are they closer to the goal? Are they further to the goal? So I think all the shots that we have in the set should have expected goal values as well to say this shot was taken from this position. It has a 10% chance of becoming a goal. So based on the historical data, I think we have a couple of years that we've shared here what is the percentage of this particular team winning the next game? Um, that's the, the most uh, basic. Um, that's the most basic aspect we can look at. Um, here's a game. Who's going to win the next one? In the long run, we want to look at an entire league because then, if we know, can we predict who's going to win the league this season based on three, five, four, five years worth of data? Then that will be much better. But for now, the focus is just on a game. Brilliant. I'm not even a I'm not even a data science, but uh, that sounds like a really juicy problem. And I, I I mean I would be excited to to get stuck into that. I think it's 
I think it's an ideal challenge for, for machine learning and because I think it's the kind of thing that we couldn't predict other than based on instinct and form and, and more anecdotal evidence. So really like putting that data to work to get real predictions, I think that is so cool. Really excited to see what comes out of it. Lee, thank you so much. I really appreciate you um, joining us. Uh, I think there's one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just going to ask a question um, in terms of <clears throat> you mentioned that you would, you would also be interested in like um, for people that are gambling so that they kind of know um, which team is most likely to win. Um, do you ever think that for other people that are like um, looking for arbitrage betting to see if there's a what do you call it a discrepancy because what your what your model says versus what the Betting house is saying, just out of interest. For um, example, so, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, for, for example, your models might be saying that Chiefs versus Sundowns, um, Sundowns has a 80% chance of winning, while the betting house says there's a 30% chance of winning. Has that ever happened in like with your with the type of data that you guys have? So, um, Bulelani, sorry, we've been mostly uh, doing uh, descriptive stuff. So we've just been describing things that happen in the field. Okay. These are first foray into predictive. But okay. then in terms of in the market out there, this is the, the betting companies also have their models. They also have their predictions. At the end of the day, different models will come up with different values. And if yeah. your model is better and can better predict, then you always have that edge in the market. Um, yeah. But obviously the betting houses are also always on the lookout for who's winning so much and what is it that they have that we don't have. And yeah. I think there would, there, there would be, um, they, they wouldn't be too excited about that, but companies like Statsbomb, they say they are in the space to help betters make money. Um, and so that's the name of the game. It's a competition whose model is better, whose predictive values are better is the one who's going to get it right and hopefully make um, a killing in the market. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. I'm on mute. Thank you very much for the question, Bulani. Are there any other questions before we say thank you and goodbye to Lee? Just give a few seconds. Cool. I'm going to just watch as well until the end. So if there's anything else, we can chat later or via Fantastic. email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Cool. Cheers. Okay, so uh, Rose, are you online? Yes. yes. Rose. Hi, Rose. Um, I need to find you so that I can put you on the spotlight. One second. Um, okay. Mm, okay. Let me un let me unpin myself, but you can go ahead, Rose. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, we have heard from Lee uh, on more information about the data. So what we did in this data, we want to predict whether the home team won, whether it was a draw between the two teams or the away team won. So this is a simple standard notebook that was made very quickly. I'm hoping you have more hours to make a good Start a notebook or a good notebook for yourself and in turn a good score. So in, in every machine learning, you always import your modules on your first cell. So these are all the libraries and the packages that you're going to use. And then you load the data provided. We are loading the train set that was provided for you. And as you can see on the train set, we have date, season, match ID, game ID, home team, the away team, and the score. So you can see like for this date that was in 2017, we have three seasons provided in the whole of this data set. So the first two seasons are in the train set and the third season is in the set in the test set. Uh, and then the game ID, it's just a unique identification we created to identify that this was the game between this team and this team. Uh, then we have the test set. As you can see, the test set, it's the same as the training set, only the score column that is not there because this is what we want you guys to predict. 
as Lee said, there's information about the event or how the game went. So this is a file we are calling game statistics. So, and as you can look at the game statistics, we have the player name, which we have converted that to player ID. And then we have the coordinate X, Y, we have the team, the action, for those who are good in football or understand football, uh, they can understand what the accurate passes is. Uh, all of us know that we have the first half and the second half. Then we have the manager of that team, then the opposition team, the shots, and all that, all the information about football. So this is what we have in the game statistics file. And then you can look at this. The training set has four off number of rows uh, for the two seasons, and the test set has to that four number of rows for the third season. And then the game statistic has a lot of information about a game. For instance, if you look at your data and then select all rows in the game statistics that have the game ID place, you might find like it's about 4,000 number of rows. So that's a lot of information about a game. So the next thing you always do is EDA and visualization. Like you want to look into that data more keenly. So the seasons, as we said, for the train set, you have two seasons. That is season one and season two. And then for the test set, we only have the third season. Uh, then we're going to look at the data in terms of questions, like how many unique match IDs are provided. You can see on the train set, we have 24. And then on the test set, we have 213. And match IDs per season. That's why we can see the match IDs equals to the game IDs because the total number of games in the whole of this data set, including training and test, it's 647. And the total number of unique match IDs was about 225. So the match IDs are specific to every season. So how many games were played in train seasons and test season? We say that in train we have four 12 games. And then in test, we have two that four games. So how many teams were away and home? On the train set, the home teams were 19 unique teams. And then you can see how, how many number of rows have or the count of that teams. So uh, the same goes to the away team. You can see the count of the plot of all the count of those teams. So on the test, we have 16 unique home teams and 16 unique away teams. And of course, in football, the home team and the away, the away team should be the same. Uh, there's something we are noting here. On the test set, you can see they are almost, like uh, the number or the count is almost the same. So, and we're asking ourselves a question down here. Is it because on the test set, we're only dealing with one season and on the train uh, data, we are dealing with two seasons. So I'm requesting, can you also go try to do on the train, uh, do season one and then plot for season two and then see the variations of that. Um, then did the team win, lose or draw? So we're looking at the score column on the train, on the train set provided. Uh, we can see the number of away wings were lower, about 115 also. Uh, the draw was about 130 or so, and then the home win was a lot. Uh, I don't have much information on football, but uh, what I hear or what I see that most teams who, who are on their home game, uh, they make better chances of winning. So we are saying we have three classifications. Uh, did the away team win? Did both teams draw? Or did the home team win? Uh, we can see in most cases, as, as we have said, the home team won. So there's much more you can do with this field. Instead of like plotting as I have done, you can look at every team, the number of games they played, did they win or lose on that game, and most of their win during home or away team. This data is a, it's rich data and you can do so, so much EBA. So the next thing we can do, and also on the game statistic, uh, it has a lot of information, like you can look at the players, you can look at the shots, you can look at the coordinates, try and plot that and see the different features or the different data we have been provided. So that's why we are saying you can do more EDA. 
on the game statistics file. So the next thing after that, you always do feature engineering and modeling. So we described what the game statistic file is, and we are saying you need to match that with the test data provided. Uh, it's always good to match them together. You can do it uh, individually, like you match it to the train and also match it to the test. But the easiest way is match the train and test to one file so that when you're doing feature engineering, you don't have to repeat yourself like you did a row of mean in train and then you have to do a row of mean in test. So, and when you're doing that, ensure that you can differentiate that which rows came from the train set and which rows came from the test set. So in this case, we are saying, we are creating a new column in both called train. And for the train, we have one. And then for the test, we have zero. Then in pandas, you can always concatenate the two. So after you do that, we can see that the total number of games or the rows provided is 646. And then you can view what we have. Uh, we looked at the game statistic. Now we want to merge all the data together. So we are saying you take game statistic, you merge to the train test data on game ID. You can notice that the game ID is unique in both of the files. And then after you, when you do that, you get the number of rows provided. So you can see most of the data provided in the game statistic or in, even in training test is categorical. So how do you deal with that data? And we are saying there are various ways of doing that. You can do one hot encoding, label encoding, etc. So for this uh, starter notebook, it was a quick one. We did label encoding. You can try various and so many other ways. So we're using scikit-learn to do the label encoding and we, we're encoding the game ID. And you notice here, I'm putting that into a dictionary. The reason as to why I'm doing that, it's because I'll need to see how they were mapped. So uh, for instance, you don't map this game to one. And then when you come to use the game ID, when you're creating the submission file, you can't know which ID was mapped to one or zero. So it's always good to store that in a dictionary. Uh, for the player, player ID, I don't need that later. So for this one, we are not going to create a dictionary to map the files or the data. And we are saying for the teams, ensure that they are transformed the same. So when you come to label encoding in scikit-learn, it encodes on how the rows are positioned or the order of the rows. So, uh, Team A might be encoded one, team B might be encoded two. And when you go to another column, if team B came before team A, then it will be encoded one instead of two. That's why we are saying you have to keep track of what you've done because you can see here we have team and opposition team. And the unique number of teams in this column and the opposition team is the same. And also there was also something to do with the next team. Ensure that when you're encoding, uh, we have the home team and away team. Ensure that when you're coding, encoding, all the five columns that involve the teams are encoded the same. Uh, you can try other ways, but the easiest way I did was you create a dictionary as well that maps the team to the, the values that they were given. You can see it here, this team was mapped as zero, and, and so forth. This was mapped as 21. And then we are doing everything about the team. Then it's a dictionary. To get information from a dictionary, use key value. Uh, then we are mapping the action, halftime, manager. Then um, for this notebook, I'll drop most of the column that have a lot of none values, but you know that is not the best way to do this. There's a lot of information from those columns. If you go back to all the data, you can see that whatever Lee was talking about, the next player, the next action, the next coordinates, the events, most of them are none. But there's a way you can look at all the data provided and see how you can feel that. So for this, we dropped most of those columns. I even dropped the date column because I want you to be uh, inquisitive about the date. Can you look at the day? Do some particular days affect the team scores? Are games played on the weekend better? Are games played during the weekdays better? I don't know. You can look at you can look that in the data. 
Uh, then after that, we need to now unpack this data to our train and test. So we get our train and we also get our test. Then you can see the shape of train and the shape of test. It's always good to, uh, after you unmap something or after you do some processing on a particular file, it's always good to look at it and see if you did it correctly. So we can see on the train, we have been able to change most of the categorical columns into something a machine learning model will understand. But you can see the score team is not yet uh, encoded because if we encoded the score team when the test set was there, would have a column or a value that is none. And we don't want to encode that. So for the train set, since that column is not on test, you, are, you encode it differently. And then since uh, when you're submitting, we need to know which was away. Is zero away, is one draw etc. So as we said about mapping, we are doing the score mapping as well. You can see that away win was zero draw, so forth. Um, then you go to modeling. You're saying this is a classification problem and it requires classification machine learning algorithms. So yeah, this is what you do when you have the features, the X and the Y. We're using a simple random forest classifier. Uh, then you fit the model. Uh, when you look at the test, after we unmapped some of uh, the rows are null. So I choose to fill the nulls with zeros, but you can choose to fill differently because uh, most of the columns that were null, we had short, goals called and goals considered accurate passes. Everything I filled with zeros. There were about 92 rows that are null, but I did choose to fill that with zero. So uh, you can choose to deal with that differently, which I recommend or I advise because that will give your data more information. You can choose to fill with mean, median, so forth. So the next thing we have already done our modeling and so forth. So you need to predict on the test data. So we are taking our test prediction, uh, our classifier you predict on the test data provided, then our score. You can see our unique score is 012, which we had here 012 for away, draw and home win. Uh, we need to unmap now our scores to strings. That's why we are doing this. And then, yeah, we pass that score mapping there. And the same case to game. Game ID was 0, 1, 2, up to 645. We also need the game IDs converted back to the way they were in this case. And then you can see after we have done that mapping, this is how the test set is. You can see our game ID is mapped back. And then also our score that we have predicted is mapped back. So we create a submit data frame which we only need the game ID and the score. So uh, for this, you'll notice that the reference of the submission file only has 234 games. That is for the season three. But after we included the game statistic, you saw the data was a lot, like about 802K. But we don't need that because uh, like 400 or 4,000 rows are about the same team. It's only the information of that game. So what we need is you to submit to 34 rows. There's a better way of selecting. Maybe you can look at among that game, like the game between Man U and Man City that has 4,000 information. Uh, you can choose which away team or between the three classification, you can be wise on how to choose the prediction. So for this case, I just selected randomly. So you can see I dropped the duplicates and then selected, is it an away and so forth. So then we have our data here. Then we created our submission file. And we are saying uh, to do try cross validation. You can notice that uh, I didn't do any cross validation. Uh, and I'm saying be careful with this. So in most machine learning model, you use train test split from scikit-learn, which trains or splits your data in a random way. So, but for this, in our test set, you can notice it's only season three. 
So maybe you can also split the training set in your cross validation, the data that you use for test is season one, and then the data that you use for validation is season two. It's something to think about. Uh, we are saying the data column might be useful. Try to look at that and also try not to drop so many columns. So try to be wise in the columns. Yeah, that's it. Good luck to all of you. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, that was a uh, high speed, but a very detailed run through. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, just share one question that popped up in the chat just at the end. Um, ben asked if you could explain again what you, you just said right at the end here about the how you making, you're making team selections for the submission file. Could you just run through that briefly? Okay. Yes. So um, with our test set, uh, when you make your prediction, I'm saying we have um, this number of rows, but this comprises of the same game, like 400 rows might comprise of the same game. So um, I think the best way to do this, let's go to the game statistic file. Yeah, you can see this is the same game. And it goes for up to uh, 3,000 rows. So in machine learning, if we, were to tell, if we were to tell you to provide an answer for each and every row, then this would be the same answer. Let's say this team won. So this would be away win, away win, away win, away win, away win, which it's kind of repetitive. So what we are doing here, Yes, uh, what we are doing here, we are selecting in a random way. That is what I chose, but you can be wise because let's say for instance, this game. So for the first row, this, your model predicted this was away win, away win. Uh, we win, but this was a draw. And then this was home win. So um, from a logical perspective, since the away win is a lot, that is what you'd have selected. But from a random perspective, which we are using here, the model we have selected draw. So this was random to make it faster, but for you, you will have to look at like for this particular game, how many rows did it predict as a way win? And how many rows did it predict as draw? And how many rows did it predict as home win? And then you'd be wise on which one to select. Paul? Great, thank you very much. I think that is clear. If there are any further questions, I'm just watching the time here. We're, we're very close to our hour. If there are any further questions, please do post them in the discussion forum. Um, thank you so much, Rose. Uh, that's Rose Wambui, our um, in-house data scientist at Zindi. Um, really appreciate the, the clear and concise uh, starter notebook. There are a few questions on, um, on where you can find the notebook that is in the data section on the competition page um, on Zindi. Um, Right, so that is all we have time for. I'm gonna wrap up quickly just to say the competition is live on Zindi. Um, the link is in the chat and the competition, it has prize money of 300 US dollars as well as 500 points. And uh, all that's left for me to say is uh, a very good luck and I hope you have a lot of fun